You know, you may consider yourself a loner, but let me tell you something. Being a member of a group has its advantages. In fact, there's a reduced need for vigilance, which leads to your own personal safety. More individuals for locating food and more capability in acquiring or defending a territory. But most importantly is the opportunity to learn by observing the other members of your group. By observing the behavior and actions of experienced members of the group, the observer can significantly reduce or even eliminate the cost of learning by trial and error. I always said, it's the lonely dog that has no choice but to learn the hard way. Now, one such way that an individual can learn from the actions of another is through what we call social referencing, whereby an individual uses the emotional information provided by an informant about a novel object or stimulus to guide his or her own future behavior towards it. Meaning, if you're more experienced and you're afraid of something, then perhaps I should be as well. And vice versa, if you're confident about something, then maybe I should be as well. Many studies across a wide range of different species has been done on the effects of social referencing. For instance, monkeys were actually taught to avoid snakes, to be afraid of them, try to avoid them, get away from them, simply by watching videos. So hey, pay attention. You can learn something from watching a video. If a monkey can, you can as well. Na fly naive mice were placed in a tank right next to another aquarium type tank with mice that were subjected to biting flies. And these mice over here were able to observe them for 24 hours. And they watched these other mice, these poor mice, diving underneath their bedding, trying to get behind all the other objects inside the tank, doing anything and everything that they could to get away from the biting flies. Now after the 24 hours, the flies were then placed in the tank of the observer mice with one altercation. The mouth parts of the fly, the part that bites you, was removed. Yet, these mice who had never been bitten by a fly in their entire life were using the same defensive actions, displaying the same behavior as the other mice who were actually bitten by the flies. They were diving underneath their bedding. They're getting behind objects. They did everything that the other mice did, even though the flies were doing a darn thing to them. Simply from social referencing. Now with dogs, many studies have been done. But one I want to note today was one done by Dr. Isabella Marola at the University of Milan. And she and her colleagues, they, they set up a, a little test in which they took a fan, a little electric fan, and they tied all these ribbons to it, and they turned it on. Now, of course, when that fan's rotating, it's blowing these ribbons, and the ribbons are just giving this all over the place. And what they did is they put dogs in a room with that fan and observed their behaviors. And most of the dogs avoided it. They looked at this thing and went, oh, no, what the heck is that? I'm out of here. And then at other times, they would then place in the room a dog who had been already habituated to that fan in the past, who was confident, who approached it. And what they saw is that the fearful dogs did the same thing. They approached the fan. Then, of course, they interchanged the whole thing with humans. They had humans in a room who acted confident, and the dog would go with them up to the fan, and vice versa. Those who act afraid, the dogs avoided the fan, even the ones who had already learned to not be afraid of the fan, simply based upon the actions of the human being. Okay, so now I kind of replicated a, just a portion of that little study, not the whole thing. I don't have all the dogs that was available to Dr. Marola and her colleagues. So I just bothered, I, bothered, I just used uh, basically Otis. And Otis is a, uh, is a year and a half old English bulldog. And as you'll watch in the video, Otis comes out of a room. We've got a fan turning right there with some ribbons in it. And he comes right through the two glass doors. Now watch him approach. He's checking this thing out and then, oh, okay, whatever that is, I think I'll just leave it alone. Now the second try, he approaches a little closer this time, but oh, okay, I'm out of here. But first, let me check this hole, see if there's a mouse in it. And he's just investigating that. Okay, so eventually, I walk up to the fan with Otis on the leash. 
I don't drag him up to the fan. I simply just walk up to it confidently. And you see he investigates the fan a little longer with a little bit more curiosity. And then after a second attempt, we walk all the way up to the fan. Now first, he's so unconcerned about the fan that he has to check out all the dog smells on my feet. And then eventually I was able to coax him all the way to the fan. He actually started to play with one of the ribbons. And as you see there in this video, that my confidence completely changed the behavior of Otis. He approached the fan because I approached the fan. He looked in my direction. Hey, is it safe? What is that thing? But I noticed Brian's going to it. He doesn't seem to have a problem with it. And because I've done a little bit of work with Otis, he knows that I'm more experienced than he is. And so he followed my lead. So what does this mean to you as a dog owner and a dog trainer, training your own dog? Years and years, people have heard me say, the attitude that goes down the leash is often the one that will come back. And when I was saying that, I was referring to social referencing. This is the absolute truth. Further studies have been done on the stress response of dogs. And the University of Sweden determined that dogs actually mirror their owner's stress response. So yeah, there's a whole lot to be said about social referencing. Think about any times in your life in which you didn't do a certain thing, a certain action, because you were able to observe what someone else did. And you went, ha, oh man, <laughs> oh, whew, that was close. I was just about to do the same thing, but he just did it and I saw what happened to him. So I tell you what, I'm just gonna avoid that. I mean, there's a benefit to living in a group. There's definitely some disadvantages, but there's a big advantage in that you don't have to learn everything in the world through trial and error. You get to learn some things through public information, just simply watching how other members of your group deal with a novel object, a novel stimulus, or even one that they know. You get to watch them. Wow, so many studies. And I'll make sure I put a link uh, so that you guys can click on those and, and read some of those studies for yourself. So just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. If you're walking down the sidewalk with your dog, I, here I am, I'm coming down the sidewalk with my dog. I'm walking with it. Got on the end of my leash here. And I look up ahead and I see someone coming. Now through the past history of me walking my dog, my dog has displayed aggression or fearfulness when any time we encounter someone else with a dog. Now, okay, so I know that. So next thing you know, I'm going, oh geez, oh geez, oh no, here comes someone, okay, tell you what, let's move over here, let's get all the way over here, there we go, now we're safe. Yeah, so of course the dog, who may, who may, with that particular dog, maybe through its actions, maybe that human, was actually gonna do fine with it. But now all of a sudden it looks at you and you're going, oh no, oh no, you're all white on the, my knuckled on the leash. It's going, uh, should I be worried about that? Are you are worried about that? Should I be worried about that? And now all of a sudden, they are worried about that. They are. The best way to get over that, because sometimes being concerned is, is, is genuine from you, but it's also warranted. Yeah, previous actions on the part of your dog where your dog almost bit someone, jumped on someone, you're concerned about it. You're afraid. So I get this all being a human being. But here's one thing that I can definitely recommend for you to get over that part. You know, the dog may always at some point be fearful of a certain type of dog or maybe all dogs and maybe just some people, maybe just guys, maybe girls. Those things you work through over time. But one thing that you can do quickly is master control over your dog. Yes, there, you've seen Captain in a ton of my videos, my, my Blue Healer, my Australian cattle dog. But know this, he's not confident with everything in the world. And I have predictive information. I know what he's not confident about. I know. But I know this as well. I have total control over Captain. Total control. And so because if I'm walking down a sidewalk, there are some dogs that definitely 
get him going. I call it white tail rising. Captain's got this really incredible white tail for a blue healer. And up it goes. Up it goes. Well, I know that I can control my dog. So because of that, hey, I got this thing. Just so you know. Stand down. Put your tail down. In fact, switch. He goes over this side over here. Good morning. How are you? Nice dog you have. We pass by someone. Everything's looking good. Free. Relax my dog. And I don't have him reacting because he looks at me. I kid you not, as soon as that tail goes up, the first thing he does after that is look back at me. Should we be afraid? What do we need to do? Do we need to evade this thing? Do we need to attack this thing? What are you going to do, Brian? Well, he finds out in a real hurry. Hey, stand down. Heel. Switch. Over here. I got this thing. Lean on me, buddy. I got it. I'm confident. And I'm only that way because I know I have absolute control. I know he will drop back to a heel. I know he will switch to the other side. I know he will stop and sit. He will lie down. He will stay. He will not jump. He will come to me when I call him. He will be quiet when I don't want to bark anymore. I have total control over his behavior. And because I do, I have absolute confidence in my ability to control him around any novel object or stimulus, or even those that have been known to cause him to react in an adverse way. I have total control over my dog. So if you lack that, get busy. Really work with your dog. Get busy. Build your confidence first. Build yours first. Because remember, dogs that were confident around the fan, that had encountered the fan, who had habituated to the fan, were made to be afraid of the fan when they were in the company of someone that they perceived as more experienced than them, and they were afraid. So know that. Your dog, you can take a perfectly calm dog and make it afraid because of your actions. So whatever it is that's causing you anxiety, causing you to be fearful within multiple encounters with you and your dog, work on it. Work on it. And again, there's many things that you can do, and I'll have those other things that you can do. I'll just produce videos on them. But in the meantime, control your dog. Learn how to control your dog. Get that confidence because social referencing does happen and it happens multiple times per day. Always be that thing, that being that your dog looks to for protection, for guidance, direction. Be that positive thing and I promise you, you will start to build more confidence in your dog. Your dog's reactivity will lessen over time, simply through social referencing. So be a good leader, just keep in mind, whatever goes down the leash, the attitude that goes down there, is often the one that comes back. Be confident. Hey guys, if you enjoy my videos, or better yet, find them beneficial to your relationship with your dog, please like the video, share it with another dog-loving friend, and subscribe.